Uh, greetings, everyone. This is Peg Brady from NOAA Fisheries in the NOAA Library based here in Silver Spring, Maryland. Uh, today, this is the EBM seminar series that you're joining today. And um, this is a, a series that we've put together. It's been running for over a year now on a monthly basis on the second Wednesday of each month at this time. And it is uh, to underscore much of the work that NOAA Fisheries and other parts of NOAA are working on in support of our policy of ecosystem-based fisheries management. If you care to learn more, you can visit our website to learn more about what we're doing and more about the policy if you're not familiar with it. Um, today's speaker is Jefferson Hinkey, who will be joining us online uh, from the Southwest Fisheries Science Center. Uh, Jefferson is a research fisheries biologist in our Southwest Fisheries Science Center, and he coordinates the seabird research uh, at two small research facilities based in the Antarctic. Uh, he joined the uh, Southwest uh, Center for the Ecosystem, Antarctic Eco Ecosystem Research Division in 2009. And so I will turn this uh, presentation over to Jefferson. Uh, we'll be taking questions um, at the end of the presentation from folks online and, and folks here in the room in the NOAA Library. So um, thank you all for joining us again to all the folks that are returning and uh, welcome to any of our new attendees. So Jefferson, it's all yours now. All right, uh, thanks very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's uh, noon out here on the West Coast. Um, it's a real pleasure to uh, have the opportunity to, to give this seminar. Um, this was actually a talk that I had presented and put together for the Marine Resources Education Program that happened here in La Jolla, um, I think last June. So if any of you were uh, there or um, had a chance to see that, then this might be awfully familiar. I just wanted to let people know that that might be the case. Um, so anyway, what I want to do today is we're going to talk a little bit about uh, fisheries in the Southern Ocean, and particularly Antarctic krill. And I think the best way to get into this is to uh, just give you a brief, very brief overview of the work that our division here in, at the Southwest Center does, the Antarctic Ecosystem Research Division. Then to set up a little bit about what CAMELAR is all about, the, the management agency or the, the body that um, has the authority to manage fisheries in the Southern Ocean, I think it's worth understanding a little bit about the history of exploitation in the Antarctic and why krill is such an important component of the ecosystem there. Um, then we'll move into a little bit more about CAMELAR itself. The, that is the, the Convention on the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources the framework that it has developed and how then that has allowed uh, management to develop in the Antarctic. And that will all tie in then to the ultimate goal of the talk is to think a little bit about how this relates to ecosystem-based fisheries management. And I'm going to talk about two particular kinds that I like to differentiate. One is a tactical version of EBFM versus a more strategic one, and I'll explain what those are as we move through the talk. And finally, we'll just end with a brief summary. So let me launch into a little bit more about the Antarctic Ecosystem Research Division here at the Southwest Center. Uh, this is a research division um, that's been active since the mid-1980s, doing ecosystem-based research to advise fisheries management in the Southern Ocean. And we really cover everything from uh, the oceanographic kinds of cruises and, and properties of the ocean on up to uh, large cetaceans, seabirds, and we use uh, all manner of observational techniques to conduct our research, whether that's shipboard, in the field, which is where I primarily work in our field camps, but also starting to use some new research technologies like drones and autonomous underwater vehicles. Um, our future is changing, and in fact, it's actually really appropriate that I can give this talk today because just yesterday was the first day of our new approach to at-sea surveys. In the past, we've used uh, large research vessels uh, yesterday was the first day we actually put uh, our gliders, pictured there in the upper left, into the water in the Antarctic. So it's day one for our new research programs. So we're starting to use autonomous gliders to uh, conduct our survey grids to look at uh, the properties of the, of the water column, but also to use um, sonar and um, acoustic surveys to uh, get estimates of krill biomass, those sorts of things uh, that we're very interested in in our research. Um, so, like I said, we're starting to use new, new approaches to doing our work, uh, gliders, underwater moorings. That array is now also active as of yesterday for the very first time, so we're very excited to see how this plays out. 
Um, but also we're doing a lot of new collaborative efforts uh, with the National Science Foundation, for example. We've had a strong relationship with them going in, in the past, but also other nations and their research cruises um, using vessels of opportunity like fishing vessels and also passenger and tourist vessels to move personnel in and out of the field camps. And there on the right side, you can see some examples of the new technologies that we're very excited to employ in our research, things uh, like uh, uh, unmanned aerial systems we've been using and, and developing for work in the Antarctic. And there at the bottom, you can see an image uh, from an animal born video camera, which we're also starting to actively deploy as we move forward to better understand interactions of predators with prey at the scale with which those uh, interactions happen. So um, that's just a very brief overview of the Antarctic Ecosystem Research Division. Um, and like I said, we've been active in the Antarctic since the mid 1980s and continuing to do so. So let's talk about um, moving on now into the ecosystem-based fisheries management questions in the Southern Ocean. And one of the reasons it's important to think about it in an ecosystem context is because we've been, uh, humans have been harvesting there um, since, essentially since we, we discovered that there was a continent in the Southern Ocean. Um, and this is a quote from a paper from a, uh, almost two decades ago about how the Southern Ocean has experienced notable collapses of marine species following exploitation. And I think it's useful to understand that series of, of, of collapses as we think about how the fisheries are managed today. Um, the Antarctic fur seals is one of the first targets of exploitation. It was harvested in the late 19, or 1790s and 1820s. Um, and th very rapidly that species was hunted to near extinction. And in fact, it was thought to be extinct until it was rediscovered in the, in the 1900s. Um, fortunately, that population has recovered and, and uh, is, is doing quite well in parts of, uh, of its range. Shortly after the, the fur seal uh, hunts, um, whaling began, and those were harvested mainly in the, in the 1900s, and this represented really just a series of, of depletions of, of large marine mammals, the blues, the fins, the says, and, and the sperm whales. Um, most of those populations remain at very low levels relative to pre-exploitation. And there's a lot of uh, ecological thought about the consequences of that removal of such a large biomass of a predator that consumed a lot of krill. Uh, once whaling was sort of on the downswing, um, fin fishing began in the Antarctic as well. Um, harvesting ramped up and by the late 1970s, within just a few short years of harvesting, serious declines in some populations were noted. Um, that prompted some moratoriums to be put in place on ground fishing for species like these ice fish and rock cod that are pictured there. And in most cases, particularly in the Southwest Atlantic region, those moratoriums remain in place. And there's little evidence of substantial recovery of those populations, even three, four decades after um, those, that harvesting occurred. So in the, around that same time, uh, krill started to show up in trawl catches, and, and a directed fishery for krill was also initiated. And catches increased rapidly in the early 1980s. And at that time, it was recognized that krill was a very important part of the ecosystem because so many predators were consuming that resource. Um, there was a lot of international concern that harvesting this particular organism could have lasting and, and severe consequences on the recovery of, say, the depleted marine mammals, uh, fur seals and whales, but also on the other species that were dependent on them, things like penguins and other seabirds. And so a lot of international concern was raised about this particular fishery, given the history of fishing that had occurred or the fishery of harvesting that had occurred in the Antarctic. And it brought together a community to sign a treaty, an international treaty, um, to, to manage these fisheries better. Now, this is just a food web image to, to give you a sense of that connectedness of krill to that ecosystem. Just about every predator there, um, from seals, birds, fishes, squids, everything is linked back to krill in, in, in some way or another. And that was the, the driving force behind this concern for what would happen if harvesting of krill were to go unregulated. So in the early 1980s, the international community got together and agreed to sign a treaty called the Convention on the Conservation of Antarctic Living Marine Resources, which gave rise to the Commission 
for the conservation of Antarctic living marine resources. And the commission, or CAMELAR, as I'll probably say through the rest of this talk, is the body that has the authority to manage fisheries in the Southern Ocean. And fisheries that it manages are krill, um, the two fishes, both Patagonian and Antarctic, that occur in the, in the CAMELAR region. They're in, highlighted in yellow in that image. And also some of uh, the ice fishes, uh, the mackerel ice fish in particular. Um, today's talk is gonna focus really on krill, and we'll move into that now. Oh, actually, first, I just wanted to give you a, a better sense of how this m uh, management works in the Southern Ocean. So CAMELAR is unique among many kinds of fisheries management type bodies in the sense that, well, it's not really, a, it's, its name isn't a fisheries management organization, it's actually a conservation organization, but it has the authority to manage fisheries, and it does so based on consensus and the best available science. And at present, it's an international body and it's composed of 24 different member states plus the European Union. And as you may or may not imagine, um, reaching consensus among even that small number of nations is often quite difficult. Um, I'll leave that there. Um, the, the convention itself, again, this was established in the early 1980s, specifies a number of considerations that I think we would now recognize as ecosystem-based fisheries management considerations. So it was an early uh, ecosystem aware kind of protocol or convention about how to uh, manage these fisheries. And Article 2 is really the heart and soul of that uh, ecosystem-based fisheries management approach. And I've highlighted um, paragraph 3, subparagraphs A, B, and C there in blue, I think probably the most important parts that still resonate uh, and, and drive the, the work of, of CAMELAR today. And that is that any harvesting and associated activities in the convention should be done in a way that prevents a decrease in the size of the harvested population. It should maintain the ecological relationships between harvested uh, species and the dependent and related populations. And there should be some way to assess whether or not impacts arising from such activities, um, they should be able to be reversed within a reasonable time frame, and that time frame here is specified as two or three decades. So again, um, sorry, I'm just going to move something around on my screen. Um, so the Article Two really is what it does is it specifies the ecosystem-based approach here that, that that these fisheries ought to be managed by. That ecosystem-based approach should be informed by the status of the stock and the dependent predators, and it should account for uncertainty in what the impact of fishing and might be on not only the stock, but also on those dependent predators and take into account environmental variability. So early on, Camelar recognized that this ecosystem-based approach was where it needed to go, and it recognized that this, uh, a reactive management was not viable for the long term of this fishery, that some sort of feedback would be preferred, and that in the interim, a precautionary approach would be desirable. And really, over the last, uh, let's see, what is that, about two and a half decades or so since, since this was, 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 was noted by the, the Camelot reports, it's that precautionary approach which has prevailed, and I want to walk through a little bit about that precautionary approach right now. So the precautionary approach as it's applied in the CAMELAR world is based on a, a three-part decision rule that basically says, so there, there, there are three parts. The first part is the recruitment criterion, which essentially specifies that they want to prevent a decrease in the size of those harvested populations below a level which ensures its stable recruitment. So the graph there to the right basically describes how this decision rule has been, has been defined. It's based on what's considered this pre-exploitation biomass, which Camelar has agreed derives from a survey that was conducted in the year 2000. Um, that was a coordinated survey in the Southwest Atlantic that was able to provide an estimate of what biomass was. Now that happened uh, in roughly 20 to 30 years after fishing had begun, but it was decided that fishing up until that time had essentially had minor impacts, and so therefore that survey would be representative of an unexploited or a pre-exploitation biomass. So that exploitation, that, that biomass has some distribution, and you would apply a catch rate such that over a 20-year period of harvest, 
you would hope that the population would would only reach about 20% of that particular biomass at a, at a level of 10%. Um, so this is one of the decision rules which is used to help set harvest rates. The second one was remember to take into account the predators and the ecological dependencies that are present in that ecosystem. And here the decision rule it specifies that the biomass of krill to account for these predators shouldn't fall below a 75% of the pre-exploitation biomass. And so the way that the catch rate would then be chosen would be to run a, a model out through time at different uh, harvest rates. And then the harvest rate that um, trips each of these particular decision rules would be selected such that that harvest rate would be the smaller of the two. Um, just so that people understand a little bit about that 75% level, that was simply an arbitrary choice that can be explained here from basic logistic, uh, the logistic growth model. Um, a, a basic logistic growth model would suggest that the productivity of a stock is highest when it's then the stock is about half of the carrying capacity. And so that 75% level was chosen simply as the midpoint between what would be considered a fully developed fishery versus not having any fishery at all. Um, so that is, uh, so that's basically the, how the precautionary, uh, system was developed early on. And it's important then to recognize that not only is krill really important to this food web, but it's also very, very abundant. Um, so biomass estimates of this particular critter suggest a global biomass of somewhere between 200 and 500 million tons. Uh, it's, it's enormous. Um, in the Southwest Atlantic, based on the survey from 2000, which is how the fishery there in the Southwest Atlantic is managed, there is an estimate of about 60 million tons. Um, so the question then is, well, of that 60 million tons, how much should be um, allocated to the fishery? Um, so here's just a pictorial representation. Sorry, I went one too far of what that 60 million tons might look like. And applying those decision rules um, based on that 60 million ton estimate suggested that the precautionary catch limit ought to be about 5.6 million tons. Now, one of the things that's important to recognize about these catches is that early on, the fishery was distributed, really had a circumpolar distribution um, with high catches in the Southwest Atlantic, but also along the East Antarctic coastline. Um, as that fishery developed, however, there was a serious contraction of the catches and a general increase in catches over time, such that now, um, in the 2000s, uh, catches are largely concentrated in the southwest Atlantic there north of the Antarctic Peninsula. That spatial concentration of the catches suggested that there needed to be a little bit more precaution built into the fishery. And so Camelar agreed that there should be a 620,000 ton cap on the catch, and that cap is known as the trigger limit or the trigger level. And so basically the trigger level applies to these areas here in the Southwest Atlantic. Um, and these are sub areas of area 48, 48.1, 2, 3, and 4. And that trigger level is the de facto catch limit that's in place at, at present. And it's agreed that that level won't be uh, exceeded until some distribution of catches on a smaller spatial scale is agreed. Now, one example of what that smaller spatial scale might be were these small scale management units or SSMUs, uh, and those were adopted um, in 2002, but as yet there's been no agreed distribution of catches into those small scale management units. And you can see those small scale management units there, but uh, those are the different colors in each of those panels. Um, so as Time went on from 2000s until present. We see we have seen further um, concentration of that catch and actually increasing catches as well. And this continued trend of smaller and smaller areas being targeted with higher and higher catches has led uh, some level of concern. And there's an urge uh, seen now as urgent that there be some spatial subdivision of that catch limit beyond just which uh, is is authorized by the the trigger level itself. And so a few years ago, um, the trigger level, there was an agreement to subdivide that trigger level based on these sub areas into different percentages. 
And so, for example, at present, 25% of the catch limit is now allocated, or uh, can, up to 25% can be caught in 48.1. I want to be careful how I say this. 45% can be caught in 48.2 or 48.3, and up to 15% could be caught in area 48.4. And you'll notice that those percentages sum to something more than one, but it simply allows for flexibility of the fishery then to move back and forth so that it can catch um, krill where they might be present in that particular fishing season. Um, so this is what the current situation actually looks like. There's about a 60 million ton estimate of krill biomass in the area. There's an agreed precautionary catch limit that is 5.6 million tons, a de facto catch limit that can't be exceeded until a spatial allocation is agreed, and that's at 620,000 uh, yeah, 620, tons. And the current catches are currently, um, this year was the first year in, in quite a long time that it actually exceeded 300,000 tons, um, but typically it's between 200 and 300,000 tons. So that's the background so far of where things have, have where they've come from and, and how that fishery is managed currently. And now I want to get into the real goal of, of management in the Southern Ocean as specified in the convention of, of trying to get into more of an ecosystem-based fisheries management uh, process and the progress and some of the limitations uh, to that at present. So one of the main things that came out of Article 2 is to have this ecosystem approach that's informed by dependent predators that accounts for things that might in, uh, influence the uncertainty in the system. Things like the impact of fishing on dependent predators, but also the, the, the important impact of environmental variability on predators and prey resources and harvested resources in this region. And so early on, Camelar agreed that it should have some kind of ecosystem monitoring system in place by which these kinds of decisions, fisheries management decisions could be informed. And what it did was it developed what's called the Camelar Ecosystem Monitoring Program, or KEMP. And the KEMP is basically a protocol um, for land-based uh, monitoring of krill-dependent species, things like the penguins, Antarctic fur seals, um, and a couple of flying seabirds, um, black-browed albatross and petrels. And the map there on the right gives you an indication or an idea of the distribution of where at present monitoring programs for these particular species are operated. And so there's, you can see that they actually, excuse me, um, have a circumpolar distribution, but they also have a highest density in the, in the uh, sun, uh, Southwest Atlantic region. And that's uh, precisely where most of the fishing now occurs. So the Kemp, and these are the species that are monitored, pictured on the right, it was designed specifically to detect and record significant changes in the, these components of the ecosystem and also to help distinguish between changes that might be due to harvesting and those that might be due to simply environmental variability. Now, obviously, disentangling those two impacts is quite difficult with observational data, and that's actually been one of the main limitations, I think, at least in my opinion, to uh, uh, how we might use these kinds of data going forward. Um, but the Kemp was actually very forward thinking in the sense that it was very clear on what species would be useful to monitor and also the kinds of indices that uh, would help understand this particular system and the influences of various actors upon it. And so we can see that you know, when, when we go into our field camps anyway, these are the kinds of uh, data streams that we're collecting and have been collecting continuously since, the, uh, since, since our field camps were opened. Um, things like adult arrival weight, incubation intervals, uh, foraging trip durations, diet composition, and the like. Unfortunately, over the past 30 years or so since this program has been in place, there's really no agreement on whether these data are actually useful, and, and, and agreement on how these data is to be used remains elusive. Um, part of this is simply because there is a lot of noise in these data, and with just monitoring, there's relatively low statistical power to detect impacts or to differentiate between harvesting and um, climate signals and environmental variability. Um, there, have, there, there are uncertain functional responses in many of these data sets. That is, we don't know how the predators are necessarily responding when krill biomass might be low or when it might be high. Um, part of that might be because the precautionary principles that have been applied to that fishery have actually been effective and not affecting predators. And I think that's a, a, that's a positive spin. On, on the idea that we don't have any certainty about functional responses. 
And then another problem with this is just simply that there's inconsistent spatial and temporal collection of monitoring data. Um, as you can imagine, um, access to field sites and the resources necessary to maintain monitoring in a place as remote as Antarctica are difficult. And it's, uh, it, it definitely has consequences for the member nations to provide um, consistent resources for uh, the research that's needed to maintain these data sets. So I said previously that I wanted to differentiate between uh, different kinds of ecosystem-based fisheries management, and one of them was a tactical one. And what I mean by that is basically having some kind of regular feedback from monitoring that directly impacts management on very short time scale. So if we were to recognize a significant impact, we could make a change in the distribution of the catch, either spatially or perhaps in the, in the allocation amount itself. Um, that's more of a tactical one. And for a long time, there was conversations and debate within Camelar about how this might go forward and, and as this would be representative of one of the main goals of Camelar to have a feedback system. And so it was requested of the groups that were working, the various working groups and the various members to go home and do their homework and come back with some ideas about how this could be implemented. Uh, that's work that our group took on pretty seriously, and we came back with a series of proposals that integrated years and years of our own monitoring data and outside data, and, and basically to show that, you know, there were ways that we could do this, where you could have some simple model that was based on a response that was relatively easily characterized in the field from some dependent predators that could be used to adjust the catch. Um, our idea actually included things, uh, not only uh, reductions in potentially the catches, but also increases based on other monitoring that perhaps the fishery could do, uh, not just from monitoring of predators on land. And sadly, this, this, this particular thought experiment met a lot of uh, quiet chirps, I will say, politely. <laughs> it didn't really go anywhere. I think we stuck our necks out and, and unfortunately it, it just wasn't the right time and there are a lot of hard assumptions that went into this work that maybe aren't um, completely defensible. But uh, what we wanted to do was basically kick off that thinking about, you know, when you have these kinds of time series of predator responses, um, you can put together models based on those data and relatively robust that would allow you to do this kind of tactical uh, management. Um, like I said, this didn't go anywhere. It hasn't gone anywhere since we submitted it to the, the Camelar working groups. Um, and I think it's safe to say that the tactical use of the predator data that we're able to collect, um, that certainly remains to be developed in the sense of uh, ecosystem-based fisheries management. Fortunately, all of this work that is happening in the Antarctic with um, dependent predators and with fisheries observations and those sorts of things, it's not dead in the water. And there's still ways that this can be used in an ecosystem-based fisheries management context. And that's more in the strategic use of this. So thinking more long-term, thinking more broadly in space about how to, how to set up catches that would be appropriate and consistent with the convention itself. And so there are two main uh, avenues that are being pursued today. Um, the first one is what's known as the risk assessments. Um, and those are essentially spatial exercises of gathering data, mapping them out, and then trying to understand if you were to distribute catches in a spatial way, where would the risk of that catch be the highest? And, and trying to get at how you might allocate catches spatially um, to minimize the risk to the ecosystem, to the predators, but also to the fishery itself. Um, for instance, you saw from the history of where fishing has occurred that there are clearly desirable areas for fishing. Those fishing, those, those areas are being identified and more thoroughly um, fished now. And so moving fisheries out of those areas would certainly be seen as a negative consequence on the fishery itself. So the risk assessment includes the ideas that we're, you know, we're not trying to penalize the fishery, um, but rather find ways for it to, to, uh, to, to catch what it needs but to minimize the risk to, to other to, to all aspects of, of that system. Um, and there's so I said there's you know essentially one of them is this data layer based way um, using it spatially. Another way that we have actually had some traction with is more of an ecosystem model based approach 
whereby we represent that system in a mathematical model and then test different fishing scenarios and different allocation schemes to understand what risk there might be to predators, to the fishery, and to the prey itself. And finally, there's other uh, strategic uses, and that would be in spatial planning. Um, CAMLAR has taken on a, a relatively large goal, now overdue, it's supposed to be done by 2012, but of establishing a, a large network of MPAs around the continent. And uh, work is continuing in that vein, and I'll touch on that in a little bit. But I wanted to go back to the idea of using models to understand the risk of fishing in the ecosystem. And a few years ago, colleagues here at the, um, at the ecosystem, Antarctic Ecosystem Research Division and also at the British Antarctic Survey in the UK um, came together and came up with a, a model known as the FUSA model or the Krill Predator Fishery Model, um, I think it's called, whereby we built this very, in a very customized way to look at a few proposals that had been advanced in the past about how you might allocate fishing um, in space and whether that would impact or benefit the, the, the ecosystem. Um, the thing about this model, I think it's important to note, is that it's, it's dependent on the kinds of monitoring um, that many people are doing in the Antarctic and uh, this, this Kemp and Kemp-like data was very fundamental in being able to develop this kind of model. Um, so these are some example results from that paper that came out in Ecological Applications in 2013. And what you see, there are four different panels. And focus on the first three, or the three that are on the left, the one labeled catch, demand, and stock. And what those refer to are different ways that you might allocate the catch. So the first one, catch, is simply we're going to let the fishery develop over the next few years based on where it likes to fish now, where its historical distributions of catch have been spatially. The second one, panel B, demand, is going to be to distribute catches into areas where predators are known to forage or where predator populations are, particularly breeding populations. And the third one would be the stock, and that's the distribution of the krill stock. And so the question then is, well, what are the risks? And this is just an example to show the risk to ecosystem health. And that can be translated essentially as back to one of the decision rules, which is based on predators uh, are there being enough krill in the system to uh, allow for predators to essentially not be impacted? So this looks really at whether or not predators' populations decline. I believe the uh, decline level here was set at about a 75%. Um, so the risk here is the risk of those populations declining beyond that um, specified threshold level. And you can see that depending on how you distribute the catches in space, there's very different risks to different predators. Um, the penguins there in blue seem to be the most at risk from a number of these um, different options. And uh, even at, even at the, uh, the current catch levels, which at the time are depicted here in panel D, you see that there's really, there's, there's even not non-zero risk that even up to the trigger level um, was, was a risk-free proposition based on historical catches. Um, this portrayal of risk to the system based on historical catches and, and other alternatives uh, led to this uh, distribution of the trigger level on those sub-area scales, which I, which I mentioned previously. So this, this actually came about because of a lot of this work to look at that risk, risk to the ecosystem based on these kinds of models. And the one thing of note is that since this conservation measure um, was put into force, this is 5107, um, and it's been in force since 2009, um, that fishery in 48.1, which has a total allocation now of 155,000 tons, that fishery has been closed early. It hasn't, it's reached its catch limit um, in, uh, within a few months, three to seven months, I think, on average, um, in seven of the nine last seasons. And so this rapid catch of that in there has really energized the debate on how are we going to allocate this catch spatially such that the fishery can grow beyond the trigger limit. And so that's where the risk assessment is starting to come in to start to balance the objectives for krill stocks, for predators, for catch performance. This work is, is still in its infancy at, at Camelar. It's uh, I, I have a feeling that this coming year, 
at the working group meetings. Um, some work will be presented on potential uh, options for how this might go forward. Uh, we'll just have to see how that plays out. Um, finally, I wanted to mention the marine protected areas that are um, under development in the Southern Ocean. Um, Camelot recently, in 2016, adopted the largest um, open ocean marine protected area in the Ross Sea region. There are a number of other marine protected areas within the Camelot domain and several that are now proposed uh, uh, for adoption but have yet to be agreed. And so you can see that there's a, a, a the dom a, a, around the continent, there's a fair bit of activity and, and consideration now and in, in how these marine protected areas ought to be, uh, where they ought to be and what they ought to be doing. Um, the question is, how do MPAs fit into an ecosystem-based management strategy for CAMELAR? And I just want to mention that this was some work that's been done by my colleagues here at the Southwest Center, Emily Klein and George Waters. And basically, the suggestion here is that when you do an MPA correctly, you basically can meet all of the objectives of the CAMELAR convention, but you can actually do more. And that's simply because the CAMELAR strategy without an MPA present is basically one to have catch limits that conserve the krill stock and some sort of spatial allocation, which would serve to protect and conserve krill dependent predators. A marine protected area essentially does all that, but it also does uh, something more, which is to meet broader ecosystem objectives because the MPAs themselves, at least within the CAMELAR world, have been developed with an eye towards conservation of all manner of ecosystem components, uh, in, including benthos, including um, flying seabirds, thing, and, and, and things that aren't typically associated with simply the fishery itself. And so the, the MPA strategy is one uh, that has the potential to actually kill two birds with one stone, if you will. And uh, uh, unfortunately, or I shouldn't say unfortunately, I think this is a, this is a, a lofty goal. We'll see where this, where this gets to as well. As I said, um, Camelar is, is actively debating new uh, marine protected areas. The one, the, the, the image there on the lower right of your screen is an active proposal in the Antarctic Peninsula region. Um, that marine protected area proposal is being led by Chile and Argentina at present. And uh, it was first introduced this year. So it's a brand new MPA proposal. Uh, there are those red, dark red polygons that are around the Antarctic Peninsula region. So lots of work there to be done as well. But it's the potential for, for these to fit into that ecosystem-based fishery management, I think, are, are, are present. And um, like I said, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, we, can, we can merge these, these things and not just have uh, MPA stand alone and still require separate EVFM on the outside. Um, that brings me to the end of my talk. I hope I haven't gone too far along. I just wanted to quickly summarize um, some things for you. One, uh, our division out here, the AERD, um, been conducting ecosystem-based science for quite a long time and, and have been a major contributor to the data and science and advice for fisheries management in the Southern Ocean um, for a long time now. Um, Camelar has a pretty effective precautionary approach. Um, its roadmap is, is pretty good and, and looking toward, forward into EBFM, there's still a lot of work to do. I, I don't think that'll um, sound odd to anybody out there in the audience. There's a lot, a lot of work to do about EBFM. Um, and it, it definitely remains a goal, but I feel that our division here is well positioned to, to help advance that, those objectives in the Southern Ocean. And I think one of the things that uh, is exciting to be involved in research in the Southern Ocean, and particularly as it regards Camelar and fisheries management, is that we have seen some pretty significant advances in how the precautionary approach is, has been developed and used, and also in thinking about spatial management. Um, there's some exemplary work in, in the Southern Ocean there, and um, it's a real pleasure to be a part of that. Um, with that, I'd just like to say thank you for listening. Um, if anyone has any questions, I've thrown my email address in there, then you're welcome to uh, reach out to me afterwards. Um, but at this point, I'll uh, be happy to take any questions that anyone might have. Thank you. Thank you, Jefferson. Appreciate it. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to the audience here for the screen and see if there are any questions for Jefferson. Okay. Um, yeah. Hey, Jeff. It's Keith. How are you? Can you hear? Jefferson, can you hear Keith? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was wondering if you could go back to your slide where you had the EFBM graph and 
expectations on it. How far so, back? You know, I'm a lawyer, so I don't get that. But I was wondering if you could break that down a bit. This one? No, uh, no, the one, that one. Like, how how does that work? Uh, okay. No, that's a Keith. That's a that's a good question. So. Th Remember, this was one where we're trying to think about how would we use monitoring from today to make a decision about the spatial or the total allocation of the fishery essentially tomorrow. And so what, what this is here is on the x-axis, you have some um, variable that we can go out and measure. This one in this particular proposal for the strategy was based on the age at which penguins were uh, essentially left independent by their adults. And we have, there's data that went into why that particular uh, index was chosen. But essentially, if, 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 if in this case, if those animals were being left independent at an older age, the probability of their survival and eventual recruitment back into the population was higher than if they were left alone at a younger age. And so younger animals, um, we're more likely to, to, to die and not survive on their own. And, and the idea and the thinking behind this was simply that in those instances that warranted a reduction in catch where these animals might be moving to once they're independent. And so the, the sloping part of that equation is simply a representation of how the catch would be reduced depending on the observation of penguin ages in the colonies. And then the right-hand side of that has two horizontal lines, one being that is the agreed catch limit for that particular region that's in place every year. That's your starting point. And then the upper bump, the higher level there, would be if, if, if everything was good in the, in the monitored populations and you saw some kind of increase in abundance of krill or, or uh, in the region, then you might uh, potentially allow for an increase in catch in that same region as well. So it had a whole number of things in there, but basically you're looking at, at some level of the state of the population or the state of the ecosystem that you're monitoring, catches would be reduced in a particular way, and beyond that, at some level, catches could potentially be increased. So I, I, I hope that answered your question, Keith. Um, if not, I'm happy to chat offline. <laughs> sure, thank you. Thanks, anyone else in the room here? Okay, we, I think we have a few questions online. So, Katie, if uh, you could not too involved. If, if these are too involved, we might recommend that the uh, person that posed the question directly uh, work with Jefferson offline. But uh, we'll try to address some of them here. Okay. Hi, Jefferson. Um, we have a few questions. Which organization okay. is responsible for krill stock assessment? Did you hear that, Jefferson? <laughs> Yeah, I, I believe the question was, which organization is responsible for krill stock assessment? Yeah. Uh, that's an interesting question because there isn't a krill stock assessment. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I suppose at, at one level, it would be Camelar. At the other level, it's really dependent on all of the member nations to collect data in a way that would make 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 a stock assessment possible. Um, we have some work done here to try to develop what we called the integrated uh, uh, integrated model of krill, which was trying to use things like survey data from our own small-scale areas, uh, how you might integrate that with uh, data collected from predators. You could potentially integrate data from uh, fisheries, from other surveys done by other members. But the scale over which the populations exist and the scale over which the fishery operates uh, at present, um, there's really no coordinated um, survey efforts to, to uh, at least that's my understanding of, 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 the, of the krill stock assessment. There's no real coordinated way to go about doing that. And the integrated model that ha was being developed here at the Antarctic Ecosystem Research Division um, also struggled to get traction within the Camelar community. Um, so, short answer is that there isn't a, a krill stock assessment. Okay, so we don't have, there's not a model and it's not, there's no how often. There's no schedule. Right. The, the question goes on to asking about what model and then the, what, what kind of a schedule is there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, and, and just, just, just to touch briefly on, on the schedule, um, I can remind the, the listeners that the the, the 60 million ton estimate, which is the basis for 
the catch limits as they exist is based on a data, uh, a coordinated survey that was conducted in the year 2000. Uh, Camelar has long considered that to be um, appropriate, but there's also been talk that there needs to be an update to that. And so, in fact, this year, there is another coordinated survey occurring. It's happening uh, early January into February, and the, the multi-member, multi-nation, multi-vessel survey that includes fishing vessels, it includes research vessels, um, it's spearheaded by Norway. And uh, that served, uh, we'll see what happens with that. There's also uh, speculation that the, the data itself that might not necessarily be used to provide an update in biomass um, that might not actually be desirable. Um, so we'll see what happens. Okay, thanks. We have a, a yep. longer question, and I'm gonna I'm gonna read through the whole thing. So bear with me. Um, in considering spatial management, are fishing fleet incentives beyond the ecological uh, part of the strategy? And so, assuming economic and operational factors are driving the concentration of the fishery on the peninsula, are there ways to address that in ways that would serve the ecosystem management goals, but incentive, incentive the industry to spread out? Hmm. Uh, that's a really good question, and I wish I had the answer. <laughs> um, Maybe you could take the question offline. Uh, Linda Shaw's name's on there. She she has her email address there, so you can have a chat with her maybe after the presentation. Yeah, that might be best. I I uh, yeah, I don't think I have a good answer for that off the top of my head in terms of okay. what incentives there might be. Um, I'm certainly yeah. I think it would be best to, to, to skip that one for now. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, and then we have one more online. Um, yep. Is there a role for remote sensing in monitoring, monitoring krill stock? That's another great question. Um, <laughs> I, I, I would say uh, potentially. Uh, there's a lot of things that, you know, are that, we used to think about the krill population, which we're now beginning to question more. One of those had to do with, you know, sea ice regimes and whether or not sea ice was absolutely fundamental or the level of, of importance that it had. And, you know, so basic, that kind of remote sensing kind of work still is relevant to understanding ecosystem components and ecosystem processes, whether it's directly related to or the, uh, allows us to provide some accurate assessment of biomass or the spatial distribution of those animals at any given time. I don't know. One of the things that you'll find, you know, certainly looking in the Antarctic uh, with remote sensing techniques, particularly in the South Atlantic sector, is that a lot of visual um, things that rely on, on visual data from satellites are often difficult to get um, consistently simply because of cloud cover and darkness in many cases. Um, other sensors obviously work just fine uh, through cloud cover. Um, so, you know, I've, uh, I don't have a good answer for this one either. Uh, but certainly we use a lot of remote sensing to try to understand the, you know, the physical properties and, and the ecosystem structure that these animals are operating in. Great. Okay. I think that, is that covered? Oh, is there another one there? Uh, one more question. One more question. Okay. What is the role for monitoring proxies to krill health, like uh, photoplankton species shifting to those krill are not able to prey upon? Could that data be incorporated into krill recruitment models if available? Could, could you repeat that? Sorry, I had a hard time hearing that one. That's okay. Um, what is the role for monitoring proxies to krill health, like photoplankton, species shifting to those krill are not able to prey upon? And then could that data be incorporated into krill recruitment models if available? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I think those are the kinds of questions that the, uh, one of the, one of the ways that I talked about how the fishery is trying to be managed is through this risk assessment protocol. 
and, and those would be the uh, uh, data sets like that, you know, phytoplankton or other species distributions, those sorts of things. Those are exactly the kinds of data sets that are being considered. Um, as it re relates to a krill population dynamic model, um, again, that's outside my area of expertise, but I, I, I would certainly think that those are the kinds of things that people are, are considering putting into those models. And in fact, there have been a number of recent studies and models that have been proposed that look at alternatives to the standard um, sort of ice dependent model of, of krill recruitment. And, um, and I think that those kinds of models are, um, while there's some, uh, there's some disagreement about uh, whether or not they're, they're, they're accurate or correct, I think there's a, a, a wealth of information to be gained and, and certainly an, an area of active research that, that people are starting to look at. So uh, I, I think there's scope for that, um, but I would direct you to seek uh, uh, some of the, 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 krill, the krill scientists out there. Um, I think they'd be in a better position to help uh, answer that question more directly. Thank you. Uh, the person that posed the question just thank you. Okay. All right. Well, I think that concludes the questions online, and there's no more here in the room in Silver Spring. So, Jefferson, I want to thank you on behalf of everyone here, and also thank the NOAA Library for sponsoring this as well uh, with our office. Uh, we do have another speaker lined up for the next month. January 9th is the second Wednesday of Jan in January. And our speaker is uh, from our Southeast Fishery Science Center, Mandy Parnaskis. And the title of her presentation is Climbing the Ecosystem-Based Fishery Management Ladder to Get Ahead of Red Tide on the Florida West Shelf. So we're going to uh, move on up to Florida uh, after being in the Antarctic today. And uh, we want to, again, thank you, Jefferson. And uh, if uh, there are any questions about this presentation, feel free to contact myself or the NOAA Library through the contact information. And we look forward to connecting with everyone in January. And Happy New Year to everyone, and Happy Holidays. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Bye.